Africans are not stupid. We are not poor because we are dumb. We are not poor because we are stupid. We are poor because we are exploited. Countries get independence in the 1960s, 19, from the 1950s and 60s onwards. But that independence was in many cases kind of best case scenario, a first step. So you get your own flag, you get to sing your own national anthem, but the material wealth of your country continues to remain in the hands of the people who were colonizing you, you before. You didn't have the material capacity to actually affect any kind of meaningful change. You were able to make symbolic gestures, but you weren't able to actually do something concrete. The vice president of the US came to Zambia, landed at a Chinese-built airport in Zambia, moved on a Chinese-built road in Zambia. The venue of this summit was actually a gift to Zambia by the Chinese government. And the key agenda of this summit was to curb Africa's cooperation with China in a Chinese gift to the African continent. Unfortunately, a lot of this really valuable lesson that we can learn gets drowned out in, in what I think is really unfortunate, often Western propaganda about the China-Africa relationship. Because the task for the Africans is not to get involved in any kind of tussles. The task is to, for us to find a way of bringing prosperity to the African people. And here, Poverty alleviation is probably an excellent example. I must say as a socialist, I'm so honored to live in such a time as this. And it's because of China. Because China has given us a renewed hope. China is a beacon of light today that socialism can work. And socialism will work if we struggle for it. China today has shown that an example for Africa. It has shown that Africa can move its population out of poverty. If China did it, why can't Africa do it? What's up, everybody? Welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing. This show aims to show you the different voices and the stories from China and the rest of the global south. Most people don't realize how ignorant they are about Africa. Now, some politicians in Western countries pretend they care about Africa because they are jealous about this cozy relationship between China and Africa, and now they want to have a competition rather than cooperation. And even though they pretend they care about Africa, but when you ask them about the culture, the languages, how many countries are there in Africa, they know nothing about it. Just like when they say they care about the people in China, they care about Chinese people, their freedom, um, they know nothing about Chinese people. They don't know about the culture, just like a lot of people when they say we care about the Uyghurs in China. In reality, they know nothing about the culture and languages of Uyghurs in China. So my show always try to show these ignored stories and voices from the global south. And today in this episode, I'm very happy I invited two awesome people from Africa to share their perspectives. So they're in the studio with me. Let me introduce my first guest. Let's start with Lady Akende Mambe. He's the head of the International Relations of Socialist Party of Zambia. So Akende, welcome. Thank you. Great to be on your show. Also, avid followers of my show, you probably want to know, uh, she's also the daughter of Fred Mambe, who gave an awesome speech. That video went very viral on my channel. Many of you followed my channel because of Fred's speech. So now you will hear the uh, perspective from Akende, Fred's daughter. So looking forward to hear your input. Thank you. And my next guest, this gentleman from South Africa is Jonas, the executive director of Pan-Africanism Today. So welcome to China. Thank you and thank you for having me. We discussed that we gather here today for this Global South International Communication Conference to build a network for the Global South, all the voices from those countries, from the, all the continents being neglected. I think one of the guests mentioned today, people don't even realize how ignorant they are about Africa. There are many typical stereotypes of Africa, but I think I will let you to tell our viewers more about the worldview, the culture of Africa. But first, why it is so important to build a united, strong Africa. How about we start with you? I'll say one or two things. Mm -hmm. The African continent has 
is united not necessarily because we are all identical. There are very many languages, religions, cultures, etc. And even in some cases from one corner to the other. The thing that does unite the African continent in many ways is its kind of shared history. Because it has a shared history of kind of colonialism, of capitalism, and even though we might have been colonized by different Western powers, we might have had a slightly different experience, it's around that that our kind of a way of organizing society has been shaped in very similar ways. So unfortunately that means that on the African continent there's a lot of people that are kind of continuing to live in a kind of state of deprivation. And what I mean by that is that the things that we would, or not just we, many people have agreed that are basic human rights, like running water or education or decent health care, or I mean, the list goes on. Those things, many people on the African continent continue to live without. And it's not, necess it's not because this is something that African people don't want or because they're too, we are too dumb to fight for these or to create these, but really because there's a degree to which the African continent has been, or let me put it this, there's a very interesting book that was written by a, a Guyanian intellectual who was based in the University of Dar es Salaam in 1974 called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, where he made a very convincing and, and actually historically accurate argument that the cost that was paid for the development of the global north of Europe in particular was paid by Africa and her people. And this is the point, that, that a lot of the challenges we face, a lot of the kind of stereotypes that continue to exist, very often people are interested in talking about failed states in Africa, the, about the lack of democracy, about the corruption in the lead. But, but really what we are missing is the kind of history and the legacy of exploitation, of oppression, and of the active underdevelopment of the African continent in order to develop the, the global north. So I'll pause there because I think Akende might have more to say. Yeah, I can there. Thank you, Jonas. I think to really understand a united and a stronger Africa, we can't do that without going back and understanding what is our history of the African continent. Africa was divided in 1884 at the Berlin Conference into countries. Prior to this, Africa did not have the countries that you know of today, the 54 countries on the African continent. These countries were created by the imperialist leaders because they were scrambling for the resources in Africa. So they sat down for their economic reasons to divide who takes what part of Africa. So the Africa that we have today is a product of, of the divisions that we have on the African continent today are a product of imperialist interests on the continent. So after that, the Africans started to fight and resist these divisions. And we also started to fight for our independence from these colonial uh, rulers at the time. So unifying Africa was us resisting imperialism in Africa. These two as synonymous, our resistance of imperialism and us wanting to come together as African countries. And we understand that one African country can't live in, as an island. And we are only strong once we are united as Africa. And we started to gain independence as countries but we started to understand one of the leaders of who was became the president of Ghana clearly put it that this independence was superficial because even after most of the African countries gained independence we did not have control of our resources we did not have control and even today we don't have control of our of our resources we don't have control over finance for our economies we don't have control over information in our countries. We don't have control of science and technology in our spaces. So we're still fighting and we need to unite as the African continent to overcome and to fight imperialism. Otherwise, we can't build a strong Africa. Like you mentioned, it's, there's so much diversity in Africa. I mean, a lot of people, when they mention Africa, they just think Africa is as, as one thing. It's like, but actually, there's like over more than 50 countries with hundreds of, if not thousands, of languages. Each country is, has very different culture, different struggles to deal with. So at building this united Africa is definitely not easy. So what are the challenges that are facing uniting Africa in terms of, uh, for example, dealing with the poverty, health care, the diversity of cultures? What are the main struggles facing you guys, you guys, you know, mission? There has always been several challenges here. And 
they include the following. Number one, it is not actually that you are building unity in a vacuum. You're building unity in a context where there are people who have a material interest in disuniting you. So the first challenge one has is that countries get independence in the 1960s, 19, from the 1950s and 60s onwards. But that independence was in many cases kind of best case scenario, a first step. So you get your own flag, you get to sing your own national anthem, but the material wealth of your country continues to remain in the hands of the people who were colonizing you, you before. So even if you want to unite, what is it that you are uniting? And then you end up with the situation where what has now become the African Union in many cases is a watered down version of the vision of the organization of African unity in 1963. Because you didn't have the material capacity to actually affect any kind of meaningful change. You were able to make symbolic gestures, but you weren't able to actually do something concrete. So this is one challenge, the, the kind of question of the material, who who owns and controls the wealth of the African continent. That was one challenge. But the other challenge, which you've already mentioned, unfortunately, of course, all people are different. This is a kind of like characteristic of humanity, that there's no two people that are absolutely identical. And cultures are different and view different parts of the world differ. But many people benefit from a kind of tactic of divide and rule. So for instance, I mean, many people around the time that South Africa was getting, it was one of the, was the last country to effectively be liberated in 1994. Around the same time, there is the whole Western media when there was this bonanza about the fact that there was a kind of black on black violence in Rwanda where the Hutu and Tutsi people were fighting one. The whole world knows about this. No one tells the story about the fact that the, 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 the distinction between Hutu and Tutsi was actively created in the colonial period. So the divisions on the African continent that we have to overcome are the, are, is another big challenge. But here I think you can't overcome them without simultaneously overcoming the legacy of colonialism, the legacy of imperialism, and frankly the legacy of a capitalist mode of production which benefits the few at the expense of the many. I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> okay, I can there. I think I'll go back to Kwame Nkrumah's quote on if we don't unite on the African continent, we'll perish. And Africa is diverse, but which continent isn't diverse? We have so many languages in Africa, we have different religions, but every other continent has different languages, they have different beliefs and different traditions and different cultures within their spaces. But that doesn't mean that that is an obstacle. That is actually an asset that we can use on the African continent. And I'll go back to Zambia, where I come from. Zambia has 72 languages just within Zambia. Wow. That's not even looking at South Africa, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and the other countries that surround Zambia. But that doesn't mean that it's an obstacle to unity in Zambia, for example. So that means that even on a continental level, on a pan-African level, us speaking different languages on the continent is not an obstacle for unity on the continent. It's because of imperialist interests that they constantly divide us. So they use language, they use the different cultures to make people fight each other because they want people divided to plunder our resources. But as Africa, there's a lot more consciousness developing on the continent. And people now, as was before with the, during the colonial struggle, are rising up again and saying that we can unite and we must unite. Are there anything from China's experience can be adopted in Africa, can be used in Africa? For example, the poverty alleviation experience? Oh, what's your thoughts? So what can we learn from, from China? Absolutely, the, the poverty alleviation. And I think the important part here is, because when you look a little bit deeper, and, and I mean, you will know this better than me, but when you really try and pay attention to how did this poverty alleviation get done, it wasn't a kind of charitable outreach program. It wasn't a central government that's saying, please can all the poor people come line up here and we're going to give you something that's going to stop you from being poor. What happened here is, not, it was through creating the infrastructure, the, the capacity for the country to create the conditions where people who are living in poverty were able to lift themselves out of it. And this is, I think, a very crucial lesson for us to learn. Because 
of course, I mean, the African continent, and maybe I want to give one or two kind of statistics to demonstrate this. What does the African, we've always had resources. I mean, the scramble for Africa was a scramble for Africa's resources. That's always been mineral wealth, but also arable land where we can grow food, etc. The Congo Basin by itself could feed the entire continent. I mean, it's a really wealthy country in that sense. The other sense in which we are wealthy is that half of the population of the African continent is under 19 years old. So we have like a demographic advantage, mm -hmm. which I speak under correction, but definitely most other parts of the world don't necessarily have. So this is what people are interested in. We have not been able to benefit from those necessarily. And, we feel, and I'll demonstrate this again, the 22 wealthiest men of the world have more wealth than all the women on the African continent combined. This is a completely kind of horrific scenario for us to be in. So the question then, what can we learn from other parts of the world? The question of poverty alleviation is extremely important. But I think it's important for us to study it closely and to study it not as an example. The, the point here is not actually the alleviation of poverty, but the methodology of how do you alleviate poverty. Because this is something, again, our African states, most of them, have not been able to seize economic power. They might have seized political power, they might have, you now have people in government that look more like you, but what you don't have is the ability to control the economy and the wealth of the country. But here I think, and, and maybe to say one or two things about our approach to pan-Africanism. There was a big debate between Julius Nyerere, the first president of Tanzania, and um, Kwame Nkrumah, the first president, democratic president of, of Ghana. And the debate was about, in our common commitment to building unity, how do we do it? Do we unify the whole uh, continent and then figure everything out afterwards? Or do we start unifying region by region. So you kind of unify the southern parts of the continent and, and then at a later point you then unify the whole continent. This was an interesting debate but both of them assumed that the protagonists of that process is going to be the governments. And at the time that was a fair assumption but the truth is that those governments turned out to not really have the capacity to mobile to, to kind of move the economic trajectory of the country and of the continent the reason why both versions of pan-africanism really didn't take off is because there was nothing material underpinning it so the point that is important in our kind of attempts to really revive and commit ourselves to pan-africanism is to recognize that every moment of in the history of the continent and the world World, where real change has been effective, it has been the people that have been able to do that. People organized into different kinds of organizations. And it's not just governments that can learn from poverty alleviation. It is our organizations as well. We have big trade unions, we have big peasant organizations, we have big student or youth groups. It's possible to learn of what it is that not just the Chinese government, but the Chinese Communist Party was able to do in lifting and creating the conditions for people to lift themselves out of poverty that we can, we can take. So that's really one important example. And unfortunately, a lot of this really valuable lesson that we can learn gets drowned out in, in what I think is really unfortunate, often Western propaganda about the China-Africa relationship. Because the task for the Africans is not to get involved in any kind of tussles. The task is to, for us to find a way of bringing prosperity to the African people. And here, poverty alleviation is probably an excellent example. Much more so than for us to get stuck into often just false discussions about whatever it is that is being churned out by the imperialist countries and by their stenographers in the media. Mm -hmm. I can do. I must say, as a socialist, I'm so honored to live in such a time as this. And it's because of China. Because China has given us a renewed hope. China is a beacon of light today that socialism can work. And socialism will work if we struggle for it. China today has shown that an example for Africa. It has shown that Africa can move its population out of poverty. If China did it, why can't Africa do it? I'm a grassroots mobilizer in, in Zambia. So I go village to village, I go community to community. And it gives much more hope to the people in those communities when you can go there and share a practical example that is within their time and say this is possible and this is what we are struggling for and we must struggle from it for it. And this is despite all the information distortion, the misinformation that is going on. But China is this example that we can hold on to. 
And also what is important is China's example has also been an example that we have to do this with our own characteristics. China has built socialism with Chinese characteristics. So building socialism in Zambia, building socialism on the African continent has to be done with African characteristics, taking into account our culture, our traditions, our material conditions, which differ from even in one country, as I just said, and as you said also, they differ. Because of climate, some of the things that you might have to do in one part of the region or in a country on the continent may be slightly different from what you do in another space of the continent. But what China is teaching us every day is that we need to do this taking into account our material conditions and our unique conditions in each space. And also what is encouraging about China and what we can learn from China is China has maintained control of their resources. And in Africa, that is one thing we have to liberate ourselves from. China has maintained control of its science and technology. We've seen strong advances against all odds of, if you looked at the world decades ago, you wouldn't imagine, a lot of people wouldn't have imagined that we would be sitting where we are today in terms of science and technology, with China being at the center and leading in science and technology. So this gives hope to Africa. And it's also hope for us who are in the political space in Africa, because we are able to sit down and say, how can we not only move our populations and our people on the African continent out of poverty, but how can we become a hub for pharmaceuticals? How can we get into the science and technology space and participate in a meaningful way? How can we restore humanity to people who have been demeaned, humiliated, on the African continent. Another lesson from China that we need to take is just the value of a person, of humanity. And that is what socialism is. Because a lot of the times we start to forget that everything we do is about the well-being of the people, of the masses. And that is what China has prioritized. If we look at how China dealt with COVID, it was about the people. It was about life was important. If we look at how the West dealt with COVID, it was about profit. And we've forgotten life over profit when you look at it from a Western perspective. But if we look at China, China is prosperous. China has gr a growing economy, but it puts life at the center over profit. And this is inspiring for the African continent. And this is a model that we have to start looking at developing much more on the African continent and also educating people on the African continent that we have been plundered, but a way to prosperity for the African continent is not through plunder. It's not through exploitation. It's about going back to look at life and prioritizing life, human dignity over profit over material um, goods as capitalism does. So China for me, it, it's actually making me really emotional because I'm so, so honored because it's like a beacon of light that helps me know when I wake up in the morning and I go into these communities, I leave my children at home. I know that I'm going out there fighting for something that we can attain, struggling for something that is possible, a different Africa, just like China has achieved and continues to strive for. So I believe much more that socialism is possible because I can see the example of China. Coming onto the flight to China was such an honor. This is my second time here in China. But coming to China, I always tell people when I move in, in Zambia and on the African continent that I wish I could carry the whole continent to literally go and see China. Because people don't know the story of China based on what you see here. The story that is told to us is told to us by Western media. So the story and the narrative that we get of China in Africa is not the picture that you see of the development that has happened in China. So coming to China makes me honored to live in such a time as this. I always try to show voices from Africa on different Western platforms, for example, on TikTok, and to talk about this, what colonialism, imperialism has done to Africa. And 
then you will get comments from, say, viewers from the United States, certain Western countries. They will say, huh, you're just blaming others, huh? You're just blaming your poverty on others. So, like, we left hundreds of years ago and you're still in poverty. So, th they were like, and or, uh, the, you should be grateful that some of your studying in the U.S., gaining the top level knowledge and building uh, your country, developing some, some technologies. So I often get certain the comments like this. I mean, you, just saying what are you, what situation you are in is the result of, it's the failure of yourself, the failure of your governance, uh, the corruption of the government, that is a problem. But I'm wondering what's your response to such idea, especially those, those ideas coming from viewers from the, from the West. I think I'd like to say that Africans are not stupid. We are not poor because we are dumb. We are not poor because we are stupid. We are poor because we are exploited. Africa has copper, it has gold, it has platinum, it has, you name the mineral, it's there on the African continent. We are crisscrossed by rivers. We've got ports. I come from Zambia, where our main export is copper. We've got a province that is called the Copper Belt. And nearly all the major copper mines in this province are not Zambian owned. They're owned by Canadian, Australian, British multinationals. They take, extract the copper from Zambia and pay literally peanuts in taxes. The profits, or even just, not even the profit, let me talk about the revenue from the sales, are not even mandated to come back to Zambia. So the revenue from the sales don't even touch Zambian banks. And the tax is peanuts. You would ask, but then why doesn't the government probably just fairly tax? Because then they also put puppet regimes in these countries. So the governments that are there in these countries are there to serve their interests. If the government doesn't serve their interests, we've seen coups, we've seen assassinations. They are brutal to the African people. So it's not that the African people have just sat back and said, we don't want to own our resources. We don't want to control our resources. Even when we own our resources, we're not able to control them. They'll tell us what price to sell the resources at, where to sell them. And if we don't comply, again, they assassinate our leaders. They overthrow our governments or they sanction countries. So without an alternative and without looking at how can we break away from this system? Again, China today gives us that beacon of light because China doesn't come to Africa in that regard. China comes to Africa with respect. China comes to Africa for mutual cooperation. China has not instilled any puppet regimes on the continent. There's not one country that has a puppet regime of China on the continent. China has not assassinated any African leader. I can challenge anybody of your American or Western audience to tell me which leader has China assassinated on the continent. None. But we can list leaders that have been assassinated by imperialist countries. Just next door to Zambia, where I come from, we've got Congo, the DRC. We know the story of Patrice Lumumba, who was assassinated in Congo for their mineral resources. Today, Congo has more people that die every day than probably cancer. But these deaths are not reported because they fuel these wars, the imperialists, to continue to extract the mineral resources in, in Congo. You look at Ghana, Nkwame Kuruma was killed by imperialists. You look at the war they started in Libya. So Africans are not just sitting back and saying, oh, take it, We're, take our resources and we want to suffer. No, it's under exploitation, it's under harsh circumstances. And that is the money that goes and develops these Western countries. So we can't even want to follow their model of development because it's a model of development that has been based on exploitation. And that is very different from the model of development of China. And that's why when I spoke previously, I said it makes us hopeful for development 
because it has shown us an alternative that you can develop and you can alleviate a population from poverty, not based on exploitation, not on the backbone of exploiting somebody else, but actually dignifying human life, but also moving to common prosperity. Akenda has said it. It's, it's, the, it's important to, to A, historicize this. I mean, this is, I, I come back to this argument from Walter Rodney. The, the, it is almost disingenuous to suggest that the, the fact that there is good infrastructure and roads and social services in Western Europe and North America is the product of their intelligence and hard work. I mean, of course, they, have been, they were intelligent and hardworking people, but really we have to understand the development of these countries as the product of the exploitation of the global south, not just in Africa. But I think this is really important. Who so built their historic, railways? Who Come built on. these? <laughs> who built the railways? Who find, I mean, the thing that everyone in the West thinks that World War II was won by the Americans. Firstly, that's not true. I mean, it was basically Russia and China that ultimately defeated fascism. But let's ignore that part. The fact that the uranium that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to build the atom bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which destroyed so many lives, was taken out of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. That's where that uranium comes from. To go and not just plunder the African continent, to take that and use it to go and dominate another part of the world is an anecdote of the kind of development that we are talking about. So first point is that we have to be historical about this. But the second point also is that we have to be a little more theoretical about understanding what the reality at the moment is. And I'll use the example, you, you mentioned it in passing, that we should be grateful that we can send our young people to go and study in, the, in these countries. They go, kids are going to the global north to go and go to universities in Oxford and Harvard and whatever. Any country's education system is not something that exists in a bubble. You create an education system for the kind of society that you are trying to create. In 1976, in the country that I'm from, in South Africa, young students from university, uh, from schools, went onto a strike. And they went and they kind of created, it was a kind of a youth uprising. Why, did, why was there an uprising? Because the apartheid economy was structured in such a way that black African children were being educated to push wheelbarrows and work with spades. Our currency is the rand. For every rand that was spent on a white child, 20 cents was spent on a black child. Because the kind of, it was called Bantu education, different education system for the working class they were trying to create. What's the point I'm trying to make? The point is that an education system is there to create the kinds of people that you need in your country, in your society, in the future. It's about constructing your future. And unfortunately, neo-colonialism has condemned many parts of the African continent to not develop in the future, which means that we don't have education. We can, where are the universities where you can go and become, get a PhD in engineering in the African continent. The copper belt might have the most, the highest proportion of copper in the world, and it has the lowest proportion of engineers, I'm sure. There's a part the, in South Africa, 96% of the world's platinum reserves are in this little platinum belt in South Africa. But above there are people living, they don't have flushing toilets, and their children can't go to school. What kind of contradiction is this? It's because you're creating the conditions where you want Africa to forever be the feeding trough of the imperialist countries. And this, I think, is the thing we have to understand a bit better. And it's not, I mean, I used education as an example, but it applies at all levels. We have to have the correct assessment of what's wrong here. Is corruption because when you're, the darker your skin is, the more likely it is that you are going to steal money? Or is it how the entire system is set up? I, for one, refuse to believe that the color of your skin determines the degree to which you are going to be corrupt or not. I do not believe that people are so ontologically different. But I do think that there is a, a kind of structure that has been imposed onto the African continent, which the African people the working people of the world, the global south, has never benefited from truly. And that is, I think, what we need to fight against and understand and identify as the true enemy rather than the kind of purportedly lazy Africans, which is what it seems to be your American friends are, are telling us, viewers. <laughs> Before we end, there's yeah. one question I'd like to kind of put yeah. a little meat on. 
what is different between the way the West and China have come into Africa? And how do we view that on the African continent? I think what is, especially for me, I work in the international department of um, our party. So I've had to understand what are the foreign policies and what are, how do different countries relate with the African continent? On what basis are we going to cooperate? And one thing that I've been very proud of is the Chinese model on international policy and foreign policy. The five principles of mutual cooperation, there's respect in the way that you deal with the Chinese. They don't look down on you as an African country and want to come and dominate. They don't want to interfere in your internal affairs. So they allow you and they want you to be independent in your internal affairs. They're not coming to dictate what you should do in your country. Also mutual benefit. They haven't just come there to plunder, to take from you, but they also want you to be able to benefit from your cooperation and exchange. So the way China comes is with a lot of respect. And I think this is one thing that I hope the Chinese and the international viewers that, viewers that you have start to understand much more. Because I think also the Chinese are so humble that they don't go out there and preach their value system as much that, look, we actually go there in the best interest of both parties. But if you look at the Western and the imperialist countries, they come with their own interests. In 2002, end of last year, there was a summit in the US on Africa and they invited African leaders. They selected which African leaders should go for this summit. They dictated the agenda of the summit and they dictated that there'll be another summit in 2023. And Zambia was one of the co-hosts of, of the summit. Just, I think that was about a month ago now. The vice president of the US came to Zambia, landed at a Chinese built airport in Zambia. And this was out of solidarity that that airport was built for Zambia moved on a Chinese built road in Zambia. The venue of this summit was actually a gift to Zambia by the Chinese government. And that was where this the summit for democracy was held. In Zambia. To tell Nobody African people to this. work with China. <laughs> right. And the key agenda of this summit was to curb Africa's cooperation with China. In a Chinese gift to the African continent. One of our major referral hospitals in Zambia, which is called Levi Mwanawasa uh, Teaching Hospital, was a gift to the Zambian people by China. But even in Zambia, very few people know that this hospital was a gift. Zambia did not pay one dollar for that hospital. If you went and saw the little placard that says gift from the Chinese people, it's the size of an A4 sheet of paper. And this is a massive hospital that deals with over 2,600 referral cases a month. But China is so humble in the way they deal with us on the African continent. If this was an American gift, it would be reported in media from the US to Latin America to Europe to Australia. The whole world would know about this gift to the African continent. If you just talk about debt and finance, the way they deal with Africa, Africa will borrow Zambia, Ghana, they borrow from the IMF. The IMF will come and dictate how you should use this money that they charge high interest rates on. They tell you what, in, what areas, what sectors you can hire in, what sectors you can't hire in. They tell you what laws you should implement, how your ju judiciary should operate because they have lent you money. China doesn't do that. China will even waive some interest. They will waive some of the loans that they, you owe them. And they offer their loans at very low interest rates. So their cooperation is very different. And it's important that people start to understand this because there's this facade and this misinformation that is funded by the West themselves, that China has also come to plunder Africa. But no, the Africans are waking up today and saying this is not true. 
we're seeing the difference. In Zambia, I must say, and I wanted to say it, I couldn't leave this platform without saying it. People rejected the visit of Kamala Harris, the vice president of the U.S. She was not welcome in Zambia. The police had to barricade the roads that were leading to the venue of this summit because the members of parliament, the, um, the opposition members of parliament, decided that they are going to protest on behalf of the Zambian people to reflect the sentiments of the Zambian people. We have woken up in Africa. We know that the West is not our friend. The West is there to plunder. China comes for friendship. China comes for cooperation. And I'm saying this because I see what China has done. Our largest stadium in Zambia, which is a 60,000-seater capacity, was built as a gift from China. Zambia never paid a dollar. But China doesn't even sing about it, not even in Zambia. So the world should know that it's different. And even Africa is looking for different friends now. We're not looking for exploiters. We are done with exploitation. We're looking for friends. We're looking for mutual respect because we are human beings. And China understands that we are human beings in Africa. We shouldn't be grateful that you come back and lend us our money under the IMF. We reject that. We have woken up. There's a different sun rising in Africa now. And that different sun that is rising in Africa will bring change in Africa. And as I said, it makes me honored to be alive in such a time as this because a different sun is rising and a common prosperity will be possible in Africa. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed the discussion today. I hope more people will wake up to the reality of the world. And uh, I think that the fact that more viewers are coming to platforms like mine or Breakthrough News, all these uh, voices speaking for the working class, for speaking for the global south, it reflects that people realize it's important to hear the people from this region rather than their own dominating Western mainstream media. Thank you so much. I hope I will have you more on my show in the future. Thank you so much. Thank I hope you. you enjoy your journey in China. Thank you very much.